quote for today is, it's now been four months since I joined the gym and still no progress. So I decided that tomorrow I'm going to go down there in person to find out what's going on. I like the story of the CC teacher who was teaching about the prodigal son and asked the class, who was the happiest member of the family when the prodigal son returned? The little boy raised his hand and said, that must be the father. And the teacher said, yes, that is correct. And then the teacher says, well, who was the unhappiest one when the prodigal son returned? A little girl raised her hand and said, it was the fatted calf. Today we have the world's greatest parable, the parable of the prodigal son. There's many different titles for this parable. St. Pope, uh, Pope Benedict calls it the parable of the two sons to contrast the reaction of the older son and the younger son. Some have called it the parable of the resentful older brother, perhaps the greatest Name for this parable is the parable of the merciful father. He is the true hero of the story. Some have called it the parable of not only the prodigal son, but the lost son, because the Lord had just told other parables about the lost sheep and the lost coin, how the shepherd goes out to gather and to get that lost sheep and carry it back to the fold, how the woman searches dilig diligently for the lost coin and then has a great celebration when she finds it. Today we have a lost soul, a young man. I think one of my favorite titles of this, though, would be the parable of the absent mother. So the mother's not even mentioned. If she had been there, she would have said to the youngest son, don't even think about taking your father's inheritance and going off. But it is such a wonderful story on this day of joy, Laetare Sunday, because we see the great joy of the prodigal son returning. And the Lord, it says, addressed this parable primarily to the chief priests and the scribes and the Pharisees because they were complaining how Jesus was welcoming sinners and even eating with them. Jesus was a magnet for sinners. They just came to him. The Lord would bring them to conversion and repentance and restore them to his heavenly Father. And yet the scribes and Pharisees were complaining so certainly the younger prodigal son represents these tax collectors and sinners that had spent their inheritance, but now we're coming back to their loving father, whereas the scribes and Pharisees represent the resentful older brother that were complaining about how merciful Jesus was to these sinners. When we look at this parable of the prodigal son, we see this man had two sons, According to the book of Deuteronomy, the older son would get two-thirds of the inheritance and the younger son would get one-third of the inheritance. So the younger son says to his father, give me my share of the inheritance right now. In other words, I don't want to wait for you to die. Give it to me right now. Bishop Sheen says we're always in a not a good spiritual state when we begin by saying, give me, give me this, give me that. And so he wants his inheritance. The father divides up the property. The son leaves his uh, ancestral home. He leaves his land and property that would have been his. And he takes the money that he got and went off to, it says, a distant country. The word in Greek is the wasteland or into the, the vast wilderness, into obviously a non-Jewish territory, so a Gentile or pagan territory we find out because a litter be taking care of the swine, the pigs, and the Jews would not raise swine or pigs. So he's obviously in Gentile land. And he squanders his whole inheritance, it says, on the life of immorality, a life of dissipation. But then the economy turns bad, and a famine strikes the country, and he's broke. He has nothing left. He hits rock bottom, so much so that he has to become a servant at a farm that raises swine. For a young Jewish boy, this would be the lowest of the low. Not only were they not allowed to eat uh, pork, but they were not even allowed to you know, work with swine. 
And so this was his lowest condition ever. He was obviously hungry, he was broke, so much so that even the food that they were giving to the pigs looked good to him. And as you know, what they feed swine is garbage. And how many people will give their inheritance to, to really um, focus their life on garbage when God has divine life in store for them, and yet they give that up to satisfy their base desires. So this young man was at the lowest condition. He's suffering, he's hungry, but now because of his suffering, he comes to his senses. As C.S. Lewis says, God often uses suffering to get people's attention. God often uses, God allows them to experience hardship or suffering to bring them back to God. And that's what happens when this young man hits rock bottom. He remembers the love of his father, how merciful, how loving his father was, and that he realized that even the servants at his father's house have plenty to eat. So he says, here I am dying of hunger. I will arise and go back to my father. So he decides to go back and he decides to make his confession and realizing that he believes he can no longer be a son, he'll just be a servant. He says, I've already given up my inheritance, but just take me on, hire me as a servant. So he goes back and he, the beautiful thing is the father is looking for him. The father sees him a long way off as a little speck on the horizon. He catches sight of him. So obviously he must have been praying for his son, looking for him every day. And he's filled with not anger, but with mercy and compassion. He doesn't even wait for the son to come to him. He runs to, out to his son. And for a dignified patriarch of the family to do this, this shows great humility. He doesn't care what people think, he actually runs to his son, embraces him and kisses him. The Greek word here is that he throws his arms around his neck and continues to kiss and embrace him. Imagine how smelly this young man would be having worked with the swine and with the pigs and yet the father embraces him and the son goes through his confession. He's already examined his conscience. He makes his confession. He's sorry for his sins. He has a desire to amend his life and willing to accept the penance that he's given, which is, of course, in his mind, being a servant rather than the son. But look how merciful the father is. He gives him four things. First, he puts the finest robe on his son to clothe his rags and his nakedness. So he gives him not just a robe, but the very finest robe. And then he puts a ring on his finger, the signet ring, the showing that he's still a member of the family. He's still considered a son. He puts sandals on his feet. See, the servants would be barefoot, but the members of the family would have sandals. So he will not treat his son as a servant, but embraces him again as a son. He even kills the fattened calf. The fattened calf was like their Thanksgiving turkey that they would be um, getting ready by feeding it so that they will have a big feast with the fattened calf. And he slaughters it for a big banquet. So notice how confession comes before the banquet. That's why we go to confession first before we receive communion. If we're aware of any mortal sins, um, any serious sins, we go to confession first, just like this young man who came back, and then we then partake in the banquet of the Holy Eucharist to receive Jesus only in the state of sanctifying grace. And now he began the big party. Now, of course, the older son is out working in the fields. He hears the music and dancing as he approaches the house and he hears what happened, that his brother has returned, his father has slaughtered the fattened calf because he has him back safe and sound. The elder son is angry. He won't even go into the house, into the party. And so his father, the great hero of the story, comes out to plead with him. And I love if you've seen the TV series, The uh, Jesus of Nazareth by Zeffirelli that came out, the six hour mini series. Watch this episode where Jesus teaches the parable of the prodigal son because he uses Saint Peter as the resentful older brother because Matthew, the tax collector, has been welcomed by Jesus to be one of the apostles 
and Matthew throws the big party at his house for all of his friends, and Peter is standing outside. He won't go in to the party. He's resentful. He's angry at the mercy and kindness that Jesus is showing Matthew and the tax collectors and the sinners. So again, it's such a beautiful episode in Jesus of Nazareth. So the father goes out to plead with the older son and says, everything I have is yours. You'll inherit all of this. You will have this, but rejoice because your brother was lost and is now is found. He was dead and has now come back to life. Now, the interesting thing is we do not know what happened to the older son. Jesus leaves it as a cliffhanger. Will the older son walk away and not go in? Or will he enter the house and join in the celebration? We don't know. Just as we don't know how many scribes and Pharisees were converted by the Lord. Did they remain hard-hearted and reject the Lord? Or did they come to the Lord? So we should ask ourselves, which of these characters are we? Are we the prodigal son who needs to come back and go to confession? Are we the older brother who's dealing with resentment and anger and, and unwillingness to forgive? Hopefully we're all the merciful father, the merciful parent who's willing to show compassion and mercy on everyone. Tomorrow is our penance service. We have two penance services this week, tomorrow at four o'clock and Tuesday at seven o'clock. So we'll have seven of us here confessions, Father Barquette and myself, as well as five Dominicans. So the reason why the church gives us this reading during Lent about reconciliation and going to confession and being reconciled to our loving Father is because the church wants us especially to make a good confession during Lent. So take advantage of the opportunity tomorrow when we have seven priests, tomorrow at four o'clock or Tuesday night at seven o'clock and come and be healed and forgiven of your sins be restored to the good graces of God, our loving Father, and experience the love of the Heavenly Father for you. Today we have the RCIA